Hello pharmacology students, this is Dr. Sue and I'm recording the PowerPoint lecture for competency number nine which is medications for the endocrine system. Um, your uh, syllabus I noticed has the wrong chapter listed for um, one of the chapters uh, for competency nine. So I want to make that correction and I'm, I'm going to point that out to your to this course coordinator who is um, one of the faculty from Truax so that they can change that for next semester. But if you look in your syllabus on page 26 where it talks about the readings for competency nine um, it lists under your textbook chapter 46 and chapter 52. That's incorrect. It's actually chapter 46 and 47. So the anti-diabetic medications are literally the chapter right after the pituitary and other endocrine system drugs. So it's chapters 46 and 47 in your textbook. <clears throat> I've also reviewed the ATI chapters, chapter 39 and chapter 40, and they are also excellent. So I would encourage you to read those. I have them right in front of me. I'm going to refer to the insulin, particularly in chapter 39 of the ATI book, the insulin list that's on page 307. It's excellent. You should be reading that. It's a great resource for you. So let's get started then with the endocrine system. And the first thing we're going to do is a brief review of the function of the endocrine system. And you know that the endocrine system works in tandem with the nervous system to maintain homeostasis in the body. It integrates the body's response to the external environment. So it also regulates growth and development, reproduction, use of our energy, and electrolyte balances. And we're going to talk about those things as we go along. It primarily involves uh, glands in our body. And there are several of them on the screen that you can see. We will talk about the pituitary, the pineal body, the hypothalamus, the thyroid gland, and the parathyroids, the thymus gland, which is in our mediastinum of our chest, the adrenal glands that sit on the top pole of our kidneys, and the pancreas, of course, which secretes the hormone insulin, very, very important, and then the reproductive glands, which in females are the ovaries and in males are the testicles. So all of the functions of the endocrine system are listed here and we want you to review all of that in your textbook. There's a really good review of that it's, and it's especially noted in chapter um, 40, what did I say? Chapter 46. Although the entire unit, which involves chapter 46 and 47, has an introductory couple of pages on page 690, no, excuse me, uh, 666, 665, 666, and 667, and 668. Those pages review each of the gland systems, the hormones associated with them, and this same diagram is on page 666 along with all of the different hormones and target organs that are associated with them. So I would encourage you to review that very carefully as you uh, work through this block of instruction. Hormones we know are of course chemical substances synthesized from amino acids and cholesterol and they act on our body tissues to affect cell activity. We have two different groups of hormones. One group is the proteins and small peptides, peptides, excuse me, and the second group of hormones is the steroids. So hor hormones from the adrenal glands and the reproductive organs are steroids and the others that we look at are proteins. So that's important for you to understand. 
The next slide is a graph that summarizes the hormones we will focus on in this unit. The main hormones that we look at are the thyroid hormones, insulin, and steroids. And so this just kind of gives you a, just a brief introduction of where those hormones are secreted from, what their function is um, in the body. Uh, going on, you can see in this second um, graph, then um, you're going to see a few of them in a row. Um, they go on to talk about, again, the additional hormones, for example, the, in the adrenal cortex, the aldosterone, the corticosteroids, the parathyroid hormone, and the parathyroid gland, and then going on to the posterior pituitary where we have antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin, and then oxytocin, which you know, maybe you don't know, but it plays a part in um, reproduction during labor. We depend on oxytocin for um, contraction of the uterus, and there are we have synthetic oxytocin that we actually can give patients through their IV in order to stimulate uh, uterine contraction. So anyway, um, the functions are also on these charts and really laid out very well for you. Now, they also have this information in your textbook um, that it, uh, as you go through chapter 46. And that introductory part of the unit in your text. So, of course, we know that going on the pancreas ha manages the insulin and the glucagon and those types of things. So, let's then start out by talking about the anterior pituitary gland. The pituitary gland itself is considered the master gland of the body particularly in the anterior lobe of the pituitary, we have hormones secreted including growth hormones, thyroid stimulating hormones, ACTH, which is adrenal corticotrophic hormone that affects the adrenal gland, and then the gonadotrophins, which are FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. So those two are... Um, actually um, stimulated in the ovaries in females. So in the anterior pituitary, we also can then have related conditions associated to either excess or deficit of certain hormones. So for example, the TSH particularly, the thyroid stimulating hormone, if we see excess too much in the body circulating, that means that it's the thyroid is not functioning enough, so the pituitary thinks that it has to make excess amounts of TSH because the thyroid's just not responding. Or if there's a deficit, then we might have overactivity of the thyroid. And that, uh, that uh, dichotomy that we're re referring to is called the negative feedback system of the hormones. And if you look on page the first, very first page, 665 in your book, it talks about that negative feedback loop of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And I want you to just re review that so that you understand it at its most basic level. Um, so some of the conditions caused by malfunctioning of these hormones um, are listed. Um, and we will cover um, both Graves' disease, of course, um, particularly Graves' disease that's related to the hypersecretion of TSH and hypothyroidism or underactive thyroid. And then we also want to look at the ACTH, which affects the adrenal, the cortex of the adrenal glands, and its role in metabolism and electrolyte balance. It can affect all body systems. So um, we have a fluctuation in our ACTH secretion throughout the day. So we have high ACTH secretion in the morning and then a decrease throughout the day. But then whenever we're stressed, we can have a spike in the secretion of ACTH. So some of the uses for this hormone uh, are such things as um, 
you know, uh, exacer diagnosis of adrenal cortical disorders, anti-inflammatory drug treatments, allergic reactions, some of the things that can trigger. And we know that um, we can have an, a spike in the ACTH with certain stressors such as surgeries, infection or sepsis, and certain traumas that people experience. So let's first then review our thyroid hormone drugs, which the thyroid gland itself, you know, excretes um, uh, two different uh, hormones, T4, which is thyroxine, and T3, which is triiodothyronine. And these hormones have a vital role in regulating protein synthesis, our body's metabolism, and also growth and development in a developing child. And it is, too, it is possible to have too much thyroid hormone and too little thyroid hormone. So we go both ways. So too much thyroid hormone circulating is hyperthyroidism. And too little is called hypothyroidism. And that deficiency is much more common than the overproduction. Um, so when a person has a severe enough uh, hypo or underactive thyroid, or hypothyroidism, we can the patient can exhibit something called myxedema, and this happens uh, when a person when a patient has extremely low um, thyroid function, and in a child we refer to this as cretinism, a very low hypothyroid in a child. When you think of the signs of symptoms signs and symptoms of the condition. You think of someone with sluggish metabolism. And what does that give you as far as a, you know, a visual? Well, the signs and symptoms include extreme lethargy. They can be very apathetic or not have very much of an expression. Um, personality can be very flat. Um, impaired memory. They can have emotional changes. Their speech pattern can be impaired. They can have a very deep and coarse voice. They'll have facial edema or puffiness, especially around the eyes. They'll have an intolerance to cold. They'll feel cold all the time and they won't be able to keep warm. They also will have weight gain and a very slow pulse. They can be bradycardic when it's in the severe form. The treatment for this underactive thyroid or hypothyroidism is to give the replacement hormone for this. And the replacement hormone is levothyroxine sodium, which is synthroid, synthroid, which is the most common trade name. There's another one called levothroid as well. All right, so looking at synthroid being the most common um, medication given, which in its generic form is levothyroxine sodium. This replaces T4, T3 and T4. The side effects can be primarily related to getting too much replacement. So it swings the pendulum back to making a person hyperthyroid. So revving up the metabolism too much. Weight loss is common. Most, peop I mean, most people are actually happy because they've gained weight when their thyroid becomes sluggish and now they lose that. Some of the cardiac concerns would be tachycardia, hypertension, and palpitation. And those are all suggestions that the patient is getting too much of the Synthroid medication. Now this next slide shows you uh, levothyroxine or Synthroid. And you see this person up on the top of this uh, step or this uh, inverted V. Um, this is like when they've taken, they first take their first dose and they're, by, by day four, they're starting to perk up. By the sixth day or the sixth dose, they're beginning to feel really more like themselves. They, if they, and then as they, if they miss doses, they're going to go back and regress to the same uh, situation that they were in before. So if the dose is too low, we watch for things like bradycardia, lethargy, constipation, excessive fatigue, and sleeping, which are signs of hypothyroidism. And if the dose of the synthroid is too high, look at that little guy. Tachycardia, irritability, hyperthermia, diarrhea, tremors, and insomnia. So that just gives you a picture of that med. 
you're going to see it very commonly throughout your clinical experiences. So we look at um, also a condition of overactive thyroid, right? And um, we, uh, we see that as another condition that we have to be concerned with. So a type of form of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease, and the signs and symptoms of Graves' disease are related to a hyperactive thyroid state with a higher metabolism than what we should normally have. So you think of someone who has this racing metabolism. So there are only two major treatments for this problem, either surgical intervention by removing all or part of the thyroid gland, or there are medications, there are particularly the medication called PTU, um, propylthiorazil is the medication, or PTU, and that's given to inhibit the production of the thyroid hormone. Um, common side effects of the medications would be the same shifting of the symptoms of over and underactive thyroid, and we always, of course, want to monitor lab levels of the thyroid hormones if we're maintaining a person on this medication. So some of the signs and symptoms, you can see patients can develop a goiter. They can have something called exophthalmus, where their eyes bulge out. They will have weight loss, tachycardia, they'll be nervous and irritable, perspire frequently, they'll have, tach they'll have palpitations because they feel that rapid heart beating. And again, those are the two treatments that we do, Meth methimazole or PTU is given or they have a subtotal uh, thyroidectomy removal of the gland. Okay. Now, the next gland we're going to talk about is the adrenal gland, and we have two sections to the adrenal gland itself. There's the medulla, the adrenal medulla, which is the inner core of the adrenal gland, and then we have the adrenal cortex. So when we look at the, first of all, the medulla, this is where we release epinephrine and norepinephrine when we get stimulation of that fight or flight, which is our sympathetic nervous system. So neurotransmitters of epinephrine and norepinephrine are released and they act like hormones going throughout the body to react at specific receptor sites. And you are familiar with this from unit one. The second part of our adrenal gland is the cortex that surrounds the medulla and it produces two types of hormones. They both are called corticosteroids. We have um, corticosteroids, androgens, glucocorticoids, and mineral corticoids. We aren't going to talk about androgens in this block of instruction. That does relate to the male sex hormone, and we will be talking about that in a different part of our course. But for now, just realize that the adrenal cortex connects to the secretion of our steroids, natural steroids in our body. And what they do is they maintain homeostasis, they have a role in an inflammatory response, and they also give us some immune protection. Mineral corticoids, one of which is aldosterone, also play a major role in balancing our fluid and electrolytes. The glucocorticoids, of course, cortisol is the most common one, um, they influence electrolytes, metabolism, fat, protein, homeostasis, and immune responses, as you can see. So really important glands. We are going to talk about uh, administration of steroids and the importance of uh, how it may affect our adrenal function. So let's first talk about the corticosteroids or glucocorticoids. These hormone uh, functions include um, the cortisol being the main hormone. It is influenced by the ACTH. Remember you heard about that um, in the beginning of our talk. Um, also, um, hormone, these are the hormones secreted by the adrenal cortex, but usually used, the ones that we usually use are steroids. Um, 
they have vital roles in blocking immune responses and stress responses. When we see steroids used in practice, they're ordered for a wide range of, wide range of conditions. They're often given for exacerbations of autoimmune disorders like multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis due to their effect in blocking the inflammatory and immune response in our body. The anti-inflammatory effect is also the desired drug action when we're looking at diseases that we treat such as colitis or COPD. They are given for disorders in which the immune suppression is desired, such as with organ transplants as well. So oftentimes patients who are receiving transplanted organs will be on long-term steroid use. Okay, so the main uh, prototype drug is prednisone or deltazone, and its action is to suppress uh, inflammation and um, maintain adrenal function. And we usually use these steroids short term, although we do sometimes have patients on them for longer periods of time. The problem we see is that patients can develop a dependency on them and withdrawal from them over a long period of time can be very arduous. Patients will have significant symptoms, rebound, inflammation, and pain, and they just won't feel good. So the side effects of steroids are many, and nursing interventions are aimed at assessing for side effects and implementing measures to treat and prevent them when they occur. So some of them, such as the moon face and the buffalo hump, are only found commonly with long-term use. Patients can have sodium and fluid retention, the, again the moon face and edema, hypokalemia, low potassium, which can be dangerous when it comes to our heart, the cardiac conduction system. We have an increased susceptibility to infection because it dampens our immune uh, status, our protection. Delayed wound healing, peptic ulcer or GI bleed, they can be irritating to the gut. We can see muscle wasting, increased appetite, weight gain, hyperglycemia, and we can also have those abnormal fat deposits that we talked about, which is the buffalo hump, which is right on the upper portion by the cervical um, vertebrae in the upper back. Review your book and review ATI for some of the details related to this as well. There's some really nice um, prototype uh, diagrams in your book, and they talk about prednisone, and they also talk about the levothyroxine. Okay, so that's important for you to review. Now, uh, moving on with the glucocorticoids, the nursing considerations that we need to talk about. It's very important that we never, we always tell patients they should not abruptly stop a steroid because this can be, it can be fatal. It can cause severe adrenal cortical insufficiency, which would result in fluid and electrolyte imbalances, organ failure, and can lead to death. Now, that's... We ha I have to give you a sidebar on that. When a person is on a short course, so 7 days, 10 days, 14 days of a steroid daily, they're not talking about that patient. Those patients that are taking a steroid tablet on a daily basis for a couple of weeks for either a respiratory infection, uh, an acute back strain, we do sometimes give it for those types of things because of its anti-inflammatory effect, an exacerbation of COPD, they can go off of that medication once they've tapered down on their dosing and they will not have these extreme, uh, you know, symptoms. But we do have to have a healthy respect for using steroids in patients and teaching them that they need to when they start the dosing, we usually start it at a higher milligram and then we slowly, gradually reduce it until they're ready to be taken off of the medication. 
We always obtain baseline vital signs, weights, blood sugars. We monitor blood sugars because it can't, this medication can cause a secondary diabetes to develop. We always are looking for fluid and electrolyte balance. We're looking at the measurements in the blood of the electrolytes. We want to be monitoring those. We, we know that it, they also can lead to GI bleed in the gut, so we have to watch that. They also can have an effect, they can decrease the effects of certain diuretics and anti-diabetic meds, so we have to be aware of those side effects as well. Again, we talked about the lifespan concerns, so you need to review that. For the very young and very old, we have to use that in, with caution. Patients can develop sore throat fever, vague symptoms of infection, and it can be masked by a steroid. So when we're using steroids, we really have to basically do the following. What These are some of the nursing measures implemented with steroids. What's the rationale for each of these? And I'm going to let you go through these on your own. Why do we monitor vital signs so diligently? Why do we monitor weight? What about the electrolytes and blood sugar? Instructing the patient to take the medication for food. Why do with food? Why do we do that? Why do we tell patients to increase potassium-rich foods? And why do we um, instruct them not to abruptly stop medication? So that's just kind of an um, something for you to practice as you're going through this. All right. N the next um, disease process that we're going to get into here moves us into the second chapter in your textbook then, and that's chapter 47, which starts on page 686, okay? Anti-diabetics. Diabetes mellitus, we know, um, is when the, can the pancreas is not able to uh, balance the production of glucagon with the balance of insulin. So the pancreas we know contains clusters of cells. They're called the islets of Langerhans. The islets of Langerhans contain beta cells and alpha cells. The alpha cells are the ones that produce glucagon and the beta cells secrete insulin. The action of insulin is that it stimulates the cells to take up insulin from the bloodstream to be used for the body's energy. Insulin is what stimulates the release of glucose to be used for the body's energy needs. Insulin also stimulates the synthesis of the gly glycogen, which is glucose stored in the liver that's released if the blood sugar is low or during times of stress. And lastly, insulin com converts lipids to fat for storage in the adipose tissue and synthesizes proteins from amino acids. One way to think about insulin is to think about insulin being a key. Our body uses glucose, which are simple sugars, for energy. Insulin is the key that unlocks the glucose so that it can be used to provide the energy. If we don't have adequate insulin, our body cannot utilize or unlock the glucose and the body begins burning fats and protein for our energy. When the body does not make adequate insulin, the first thing we see is that the glucose is present in the urine and the patient can develop something called acidosis and ketosis due to using fat for metabolism. When fat is burned, the byproduct is ketones. For those of you that remember the Atkins diet, it was strictly limiting carbohydrates which caused the body to burn fats for energy and it sent people into ketosis on purpose. In fact, the diet suggested that people monitor their urines for ketones to see if they were being successful. In diabetes, patients with untreated diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA, present with high blood sugars, glucose, and ketones in the urine. And if that's left untreated, the patient can become comatose and it can lead to death. So this is very serious. You need to review um, the details regarding the uh, condition of diabetes mellitus in your book in chapter 47 along with the medications that we're going to talk about. Sometimes insulin receptors have lost sensitivity to insulin. They require more insulin to lower the blood sugar e effectively and sometimes the person doesn't even have enough receptor sites to meet the body's needs. So in cases of for example obesity we have a lack of uh, 
adequate numbers of receptor sites in order to lower blood glucose. All right, the types of diabetes then are type 1, which is the insulin-dependent, usually juvenile onset, but not always. It can occur after the age of 18. The pancreas is not at all secreting insulin, so the beta cells are non-functioning or not working. In type 2 diabetes then, this is the non-insulin dependent, although now we're seeing use of insulin in the type 2 diabetics, and we'll talk about that. It says about a third, I think it's more closer to a half now of all type 2 diabetics. It's an adult onset. There's increased numbers of onset though now in children over the last couple of decades because of the uh, increase in childhood obesity. And there, in these cases, the body is still secreting some insulin naturally from the beta cells in the pancreas, but they are, they're falling behind. So another type of, a couple of different types that we have of diabetes as well is secondary diabetes, usually caused from another condition, and gestational diabetes, which occurs during pregnancy. And those are just FYI. We're not going to go and expect you to know details about that. So this just shows you the three Ps, polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, that are associated with type 1 diabetes. We typically see weight loss, fatigue, increased frequency of infections. It comes on very quickly. Patients are insulin dependent. There is a family tendency. And the peak incidence is from ages 10 to 15 years. The sites of actions of the medications that are used to treat diabetes are listed here. Some of them act in the liver, some in the pancreas at those beta cells and where the insulin is released. And you can see that on the diagram and it explains that to you. So when we talk about insulins now, besides your textbook, which has a really good detailed chart um, on page, uh, let's see, 689. I also want to refer you then to um, the, uh, actually 689 and 690 to 91, there's also, excuse me, 690 has a chart of all the insulins, the different types. Also in chapter 39 in the ATI book, there's a really nice little chart of all the insulins. We have rapid acting, intermediate acting, long acting, and combination insulins. Okay, and it's important that you know all of these different ones. So, um, the information is very vital for you to know so that you know when to give the insulin in relation to when your patient is going to eat and when is the highest risk for patients having insulin reactions. For example, the patient needs to be educated about that, but for example, if you're using rapid active insulin about 30 minutes before the patient eats, it's easy to be, begins working in 30 to 60 minutes. Now, the, there are some very rapid acting. The list pro is within 15 minutes. So we don't give that list pro um, five to 15 minutes is, can, can be the onset of action. And so we don't give that until we know that the patient has the chart in, or the dinner tray in their room, the dietary tray in their room. We hold off on that. We usually like to make sure our blood glucoses have been tested within an hour of giving the insulin. So we don't want the readings to be taken any sooner than that or any longer before they order. Um, we also know that the one thing we'll hear that we want you to understand is controlling blood glucose is the goal of our therapy. That the more we control blood glucose, the lower chances the patient will have of having secondary problems from their um, diabetes. Most of the insulin is biosynthetically made using recombinant DNA technology, which is structurally the same as human insulin. We rarely see any porcine or pork insulins used anymore. Patients were too sensitive to them. I'm going to skip that last one, the insulin pharmacokinetics, and I'll give you back. What I want you to do is I want you to 
in that previous slide, I want you to be opening up your chapter 39 uh, ATI and your book to page 690. And that has an excellent chart that tells you the different onsets, peaks, and durations for the types of insulin. There are variations in it, but the graphs give you a good range. Lantus is the only insulin that does not peak. Um, and there's also the Levomir. There's a couple of different injectable ones. Bayetta, um, there's more on the market now than what even your book would tell you. All right, so this is the insulin, and this shows you the different types, and basically that they're charging their way to the finish line, so it tells you, like, who's going to get there the quickest, right, based on their peak and duration. And it's important to understand onset peak and duration in order to manage uh, properly the patient's diabetes. The actions of insulin are to promote the use of glucose by body cells and store glucose as glycogen in the muscles. The side effects, of course, can be that it acts too, too dramatically and causes hypoglycemia, which is an insulin reaction, and we can put a person into insulin shock. We will see behavior changes, diaphoresis, hunger, nausea, lethargy. I've seen people literally unconscious because of getting becoming too hypoglycemic. It can happen. The treatment, of course, is a very rapid carbohydrate glu glucagon within the hospital, but we do have little uh, simple carb packets that can be squeezed into the mouth. We also um, have glucose tablets that patients can carry in their purses or on their in their pockets and they can chew this if they start feeling like their glucose is too low. That is one of the main problems. Hyperglycemia then or an inaction causing the glucose levels to stay high can cause all of these side effects that you see. Kuzmal breathing, fruity breath, a thirst, polyuria, tachycardia, poor skin turgor, dry mucosa. So we know localized at the vessel that you have the, I mean the, um, excuse me, injection, not the vessel where you have the intravenous, but when you're giving this sub-Q, if you keep using the same sites, you can have redness, irritation, and something called lipodystrophy, which is a hardening of the subcutaneous tissues that you're injecting into. And it's not unusual for that to happen. And the next couple of slides are just pictorials of some of the common concepts we want you to understand. So hypoglycemia, onset is rapid, one to three hours, and these are all the symptoms you'll see. Needs for the blood sugar to be increased. All right, and then here's the hot and dry, sugar high, cold and clammy, need some candy. It's just something to help you remember. Diabetic ketoacidosis then, that's where your blood glucose has become extremely high. And we want patient need, patients need to have high E, hydration, insulin, and electrolytes. They have a fruity smelling breath. They have Kuzmal respirations. They'll be thirsty, dehydrated, tachycardic. They'll have polyuria where they just urinate large quantities hyperkalemia because of the venous concentration and then high blood glucose is usually greater than 240. Diabetic ketoacidosis. So when we're giving insulins we have to be concerned with interactions. There's increased hypoglycemia in the presence of aspirin, any oral anticoagulants, alcohol. So we have to be doing this patient teaching. Oral, if, you, if they're taking oral anti-diabetic uh, meds or hypoglycemics, um, and some other varieties of medications. So um, your uh, um, certain antibiotics and things. And all of this is listed in your book. Decreased hypoglycemia with thiazides, glucocorticoids, oral contraceptives, thyroid drugs, and smoking. So we have to be very careful about that um, when we're administering insulins. Sliding scale insulin coverage is something that you'll commonly see where we have a scale of where a patient's blood glucose is, and that usually will tell us or dictate to us how much of the rapid-acting insulin that we will give. 
usually at the time that we're, our patients are having a meal. And many of your hospitalized patients will have sliding scale insulins. So um, that you will get familiar with and you'll, it'll be important for you to know the types of insulins that we would use on a sliding scale versus those that we would use as a maintenance medication for them to maintain their glucose levels on a long-term basis. For insulin administration, we can give it either subcutaneously or we can, some patients have indwelling insulin pumps that we would reload. And there are also injector pens that are the subcutaneous administration route, but the insulin pens themselves can be dialed to the proper dose. And this really helps patients to manage their own disease. So it's a nice um, type of a packaging for them. Some of the nursing considerations, of course, we have to monitor the patients closely, watch their blood glucoses. The newest thinking on diabetic management for particularly type 1 diabetics is to monitor blood sugars and give insulin as needed throughout the day. So it may mean that the patients get insulin several times a day. This is another reason why with type 1 diabetics, they are having the indwelling pumps so that they can just have doses of short-acting insulin to maintain their blood glucose at a certain level throughout the day. Without All they have to do is push a button on their monitor that they keep in their pocket. So many, diabetes moni uh, many diabetics monitor blood glucose at least four times a day, typically before each meal and at bedtime. Again, the overriding goal is to control blood sugar as normal as possible and to prevent any complications. So one of the things that is very extensive for us as nurses is diabetic education because these people just need a lot of reinforcement and they need to have a lot of demos with return demos. They need to be uh, have things explained to them multiple times. They're working on their injections. They're working on their measurement of their blood glucoses. They're working on lifestyle changes like diabetic diets, increasing activity. There's just so many things for them to try to, you know, uh, learn as you're teaching. So it does take quite a while to get all of that teaching done. Um, so you're going to find that your um, textbook goes through quite a bit of the nursing implications as they relate to management of this chronic disease process. And on page 692, there's nursing process that talks about the different nursing diagnoses, the assessments, the planning, and what interventions you'll use. And there's a long list of the different patient teaching, um, you know, uh, information that you would want to provide, provide to them. And it also includes cultural considerations and evaluation. So I want you to review that very carefully. So let's look at the rationales. What's the rationale for each of these nursing interventions when you're going to be doing diabetic teaching? So monitoring of blood glu glucose or sugars. Why do we have patients monitor blood sugars? How about reporting of signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? If this is happening to them three times a day, of course, versus once in a week or in a month, there's a difference there, right? We want the patients to understand about how to report these things. We also instruct patients to have orange juice on hand, a small candy bar. Um, we also will encourage them, because there's so many variants with those types of um, products that now they have these little rolls that you can get. They almost look like lifesaver rolls or they look like a container that's about the size of a lifesaver roll. And they have glucose tablets in them that are chewable. So we tell people to throw one of those in their purse, throw it in your bag, throw it in your pocket when you're out and about. And if you start feeling like you're low on your glucose, you can pop one of those pills and chew it up and it's rapidly absorbed. We do instruct patients on the ADA diet. American Diabetes Association has a lot on their website as far as resources and we encourage the patients and their families to use that. We also will talk to family members depending on if the patient is what we call a brittle diabetic where they become severely hypoglycemic 
Um, children are oftentimes are like that, and the family can learn how to administer glucagon, which can bring them out of a severe hypoglycemic episode. We instruct patients that they should always have a medical alert band on so people know that they're diabetic in case they would be found unconscious and by a stranger or a passerby. So this describes type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes tends to be associated with sedentary lifestyles, familial tendencies, the average age is 50 years, a history of high blood pressure, patients can have low energy levels, they can be obese, they can have reoccurrent infections, and that's usually their first clue that something's going on. They'll start developing polyuria, polydipsia, and if they consistently have a fasting glucose greater than 126, that's... Um, where we have the cutoff for them being diabetic. Some of the oral anti-diabetic medications that you're going to look at, and this is really important for you to know, you're going to see a large chart that's on page 694 and 695 in your book, and I would encourage you to uh, reference that, highlight it, review it, and those types of things. I also want to point you in the direction of your ATI chapter as well. This chapter 39 um, has all of the oral antidiabetic agents listed. It talks about what the expected pharmacologic actions are, the therapeutic uses, and some of the complications for each of the categories of medications. It also talks about nursing administration and um, the kinds of nursing interventions that we have to think about when we're using these meds. So in a three or four page document here, I just think it's invaluable for you to use this. So I really encourage you to use the ATI. It's a really handy little tool. You can take these pages and print a few pages and literally carry them around and just study them and it just gives you a nice condensed version of everything that you really have to review. So the first group of medications we have is called the sulfonylureas. We have first and second generation of these. One of the important things to know about the sulfonylurea medications are that the, we know that the second generation, obviously the newer ones in this category, are better drugs. They work better with smaller doses and they have less side effects. On the next slide you're going to see some of the actions of the sulfonylurea drugs. But it, these are important drugs that you will be exposed to quite often. Uh, in your patient populations. And then the other main uh, categorization are the non-sulfonylurea drugs, which are broken up into a few different categories. So we have alpha-glucosidase inhibitors and we have biguinides. Those are two major classes. So acarbose, which is precose, is the alpha glucosidase inhibitor. It inhibits digestive enzymes in the small intestine that are responsible for release of glucose from complex carbs. So it prevents the carbs from being absorbed and carbs pass through into the large intestine. And then the metformin or glucophage is the biguinide and this decreases the hepatic production of glucose. So they work in two different ways in the body and you should understand that. And the, the increased binding of insulin to receptors, so they make the insulin that the patient already produces naturally work more efficiently. Now, the important thing about the non-sulfonylurea drugs is that they don't cause hypoglycemia as much um, as... Uh, the sulfonylurea drugs and so those that's important to understand. Now let's just go to the next slide. These are the sulfonylurea drugs, two, just two of the prototype ones, glipizide and gl glimepiride, which is amaryl or glucotrol. They stimulate the release of insulin from the beta cells. So they actually go to the pancreas and knock on the beta cells to try to get them to release more insulin. 
So one of the things to realize about these drugs is that they can cause a surge of insulin in the body, which will drop a patient's blood glucose. So they definitely have the side effect of causing hypoglycemia if they're dosed, if they're not dosed properly. So um, this visual for you is just, you know, like insulin's being in jail and being unlocked and released in the body. So it's kind of silly, but it gives you a good visual of what's going on. These are the sulfonylureas. They, as I said, this is the action that they do. The second generation ones increase tissue response to insulin by improving the binding to the receptors and they decrease glucose production by the liver. And they can increase, they can actually increase the number of insulin receptors. So this, one of the side effects to know about is hypoglycemia. That's very important. They can also cause GI upset, anorexia, itching, which is pruritus. Things that we need to keep track of is giving these medications 15 to 30 minutes before meals, making sure that patients understand how to manage a hypoglycemic reaction. The risk of this is greater in the elderly. We monitor blood glucoses. We want to make sure it can be uh, cause photosensitivity. We want to avoid overexposure to the sun. And all the patient education that goes along with what we already talked about with the insulins would also apply here. Um, the meds typically are not used during pregnancy, um, and we have to be careful in patients who may have a sulfa allergy. So this just is, a, again, a pictorial of the sulfonylureas, betas, pancreatic farms, the best beta cells around, and these are the things that you would watch for. Then we're going to move on to the non-sulfonylurea medications, the theoglitazone, the metaglinides, and the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. So there are a few different categories of medications here that you need to understand, and they, they really are well-defined in your textbook. Um, when we talk about the theoglitazone, I say the theoglitazones, that's not how you pronounce that, but it's not that easy to pronounce. The Actos and Avandia, what they do is they affect the insulin receptors to enhance the sensitivity of the cells so that the insulin that we have already secreted in our body will give us a better response to lowering blood glucose. The meglitinides, which is the Starlix or Prandin, these are rapid acting. They stimulate release of insulin from the pancreatic beta cells in the islets of Langerhans. We, these medications can be taken very within a short period of time before eating and they will directly affect the release of glucose as we're eating our meal. Um, and then the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors, we already talked about the precos, these inhibit the absorption of sugars from that GI tract, remember in the small intestine. So this is just the visual again of the precoce. And then we have, of course, metformin, which is one of the most common medications given in the non-sulfonylurea category. It is a biguanide. Um, it will, uh, it does, it, it's, its effect on lowering blood glucose is potentiated by medications such as captopril, nifedipine, procainamide, quinidine, excuse me, uh, digoxin, furosemide, cimetidine, ranitidine, azole, antifungals, and vancomycin. So lots of medications can potentiate metformin. So we have to be very careful to understand the patient's medication profile to, in order to properly anticipate low, additional lowering of the glucose levels. We also know that these medication, this medication can, is usually, we have, excuse me, this medication can potentiate kidney failure in the presence of contrast dyes. So when patients are having any kind of a procedure where there's going to be contrast dye given, and they are taking metformin, we tell them they must stop their metformin at least 48 hours prior to the procedure. 
Um, and that's something that's all, a question that's always asked of the patients when they're um, going to be going to radiology for any kind of a procedure. The, the metformin can cause side effects such as dizziness, fatigue, headache, agitation. Some patients will report a metallic taste. It will cause GI distress, and in many patients, they can get diarrhea, which is an untoward side effect that they just can't tolerate. So sometimes we have to change people from this medication, even if it is lowering the blood glucose effectively. All right, so... Hyperglycemia medications are to treat hypoglycemia and glucagon, which is a hormone secreted by the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans, are, is what we use. It stimulates glycogen breakdown in the liver to release glucose and elevate the blood glucose, so that you need to know. And these are the side effects, rare allergic reactions. Patients can feel nauseous from them. We give this, usually in emergencies, we can give it sub-Q or IM, but we oftentimes give it IV if we have IV access. You will see a blood sugar increase within 5 to 20 minutes. We place their patients on the si their side to avoid aspiration. And if a patient is conscious, we would always give them the carbohydrate orally rather than giving them the glucagon. So we have to think about what the nursing inter. Uh, the nursing considerations are and interventions for doing this. So again, you have to recognize um, what we might be having to consider for this. And here's the glucagon. When the sugar is gone, we give glucagon. It's a first aid kit for severe hypoglycemia. It's reconstituted from a powder and we don't use it unless the solution is clear. All right. So that wraps up the portion um, of lecture that I want to talk to you about regarding um, competency nine. Uh, so now I would encourage you, you can go on your own and take these practice questions. There are questions in the back of chapter 39 and chapter 40 in your ATI. There are also a lot of great exercises on your Evolve website for the chapters in your book, which is 46 and 47. Thank you very much, and we will